And Matt, you should be able to share your screen at this point. Our speaker today is Matt Walter. He's the Ag and Natural Resource Extension Agent in Lewis and Clark County. He was also in um, a couple other counties before being in Lewis and Clark. Uh, he has worked in agricultural production, research, and extension. Uh, one thing I really appreciate about Matt is he has um, firsthand experience spraying weeds. <laughs> and that's why he's a good candidate for giving this presentation. He worked for a period of time with, uh, I think it was Yellowstone County Weed District. And he also worked at the Huntley uh, Research Station, the Ag Research Station Research Center for Montana State University. And now he's doing extension. So a lot of uh, real world experience um, to share with you with this, this topic about crafting a tank mix. So Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being Perfect. here today. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Becky, for inviting me. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, for sure. And as Jane said, uh, put your name and number in the chat box. Um, I figure the more times you know, the less excuses you have when you maybe forget. But so, name, number in the chat box. Um, clicking buttons. That's my bad. Uh, it should look like this, like magic. All right, first, crafting a tank mix. Uh, let me go ahead and apologize. Usually I don't present with a hat on, but for whatever reason, the glare is a little more than most people can handle today. So uh, we're doing it redneck style, I guess. As Jane introduced me, I am Matt Walter. I am the agricultural agent here in Lewis and Clark County in Helena. Um, and I do have quite a bit of experience with application. Uh, I'm glad I don't do it anymore, more because the smell of 2,4-D really clings. But I'm more than happy to talk about it and tell everybody all the mistakes I made so that maybe you won't make them also. Why we tank mix? Uh, why talk about tank mixing? Why does this even make a worthwhile subject? And it's mainly because it's often underutilized. And kind of undereducated in some cases, we don't spend enough time on it because we tend to assume comprehension, uh, either with our clients that we're dealing with, with uh, those people in the county, even other professionals, we just kind of make that assumption. And as I understand it, a lot of folks that are on this uh, webinar series have been um, weed coordinators and agents and other professionals and also, I'm sure, fellow applicators as well. And to some of us, it might be kind of just, you know, old hat. This is what goes in, and this is when it goes in. But even then, there's some underlying understanding that um, sometimes gets skipped, okay? And I will be talking pretty exclusively just herbicides in this presentation, but most, if not all, of the methods that I go over can be used in other pesticide categories as well. So getting started, uh, there's two ways that you can look at tank mixing. One of them is the order of operations, right? The uh, specific order in which you put chemical A and chemical B in a carrier, okay? Or whether that's water, whether that's liquid fertilizer or whatever, okay? There is a specific order that it goes in. That is one way to refer to tank mixing. The other way to refer to tank mixing is discussing different modes of action, different mixes, you know, adding a little diversification in there so that we can hit multiple species with as few applications as possible. Okay. Now, every one of us has likely done the old glug and go method, right? We set our chemical out, we're in a hurry, and we just measure it and start putting it in. Doesn't matter the order, doesn't matter uh, the active ingredient that's going in there. We know what chemicals get used in that field. That's what goes in the tank. I'm in a hurry, away we go. When we're doing that and we're uh, putting in liquids, especially, you know, we never think of the kind of reactions they might be having in that tank. And a lot of the times we're putting 
multiple types of liquids in, not even considering that they might be classified differently. Okay? And we often end up with situations such as this, cottage cheese. All of you know it. Uh, anybody that tries and tells me that they've never had it happen at least once, I, I'm going to call you out on it because we've all made this mistake. And the, the sooner we kind of come to terms with that, the better because just this is a problem, right? And obviously in this image that you're seeing here, it's of a practically full tank. And we can't tell how big the tank actually is. You know, it might be 50 gallons, it might be 500. Regardless, if your tank gets this full and you have this issue, you're going to have a heck of a time cleaning it, right? Because you've got to do something with all that chemical that's in there. And you might have this situation. There are lots of times that we can kill pumps and nozzles and hoses just by poor mixing, just by a poor order or too much at once, or however you want to look at it, okay? And these are physical reactions. These are things that we can clearly see gumming up the system, right? And just a word on this picture, where it, normally where is the filter on your sprayers? At the bottom of the tank or right in front of the pump, right? And if you're running a three-point tank where they usually are right on the bottom, you know, right there at the pump, it's a wicked pain to clean because you might not have a shutoff valve there. So how are you going to get rid of all of that mix and clean this filter, right? But as I said, this is physical. This is something that we can clearly see. There are also issues that happen on a molecular level that we cannot see with our naked eye and that those tend to be the hardest pills to swallow. Uh, these are the things that end up being ineffective, right? This is when we... We spray, and because we missed one step in the mixing process, we may not have done any good out in that field, right? Whether that is rangeland, whether that's in a cropping system, it doesn't matter. Okay? If you miss a component or if you deactivate those products while they're in the tank, you're not doing any good. And who knows how much money you might have wasted, because in the end, Accurate application comes down to efficiency. Okay? It comes down to saving money. The misuse of these products will cost us in the long run. We all know that chemical isn't cheap. Anybody who's dealing with this, um, whether you're part of a government entity, whether it's a commercial operation, whether it's a producer operation, it doesn't matter. The cost of chemical is a huge limiting factor. And if we can really preserve that and we can use it to the best of its ability, we're going to get far more bang for our buck when it comes to that. Sorry, the uh, old pipes after a year of not talking to anybody kind of have become tired. So how to tank mix. Uh, surprisingly, this is a subject that I have to go over that I've encountered a lot, I should say. Uh, with professionals, with novices, with beginner, doesn't matter. Um, not everybody understands the nuances of it, okay? It can be tricky in some cases. But the bottom line is every answer that a professional gives, that an advisor gives, anybody dealing with clients who, you know, talks about spraying at all, read the label, okay? I know you get tired of that. I got tired of when people would say that to me. But the fact is, Every answer you're looking for is likely going to be in here, okay, and is likely going to be addressed and tell you how to fix it. So it's really important to study these, okay, especially if you're using something new. And even if you've been using the same chems for decades in some cases, you know, such as Tordon, refresh yourself, okay. Labels get changed pretty often, and it may be some minute stuff, but new information still is included in there on occasion. So refresh yourself, okay? Especially if you try mixing new chemicals with old chemicals, right? Uh, or I should say new products with, with long, older products, right? You aren't for sure how they're going to react. Uh, and there are certainly ways to figure that out, but it's not something you ever want to go into blind, okay? And there's certainly roadblocks. And anybody who you know, is an applicator 
for a living, right? You don't just spray a couple of times a season. You're spraying nearly every day of the week or five days a week, 40 hours, 60 hours, 80 hours, whatever, you know, from green up in April through uh, dormancy in October. You know the importance of keeping products on the shelves. And you know how utterly detrimental it can be when we start to lose access to products in certain applications. Um, the better a product will work, the better an active ingredient will work on a pest or a weed in this case, the longer it's gonna stay in production, okay? And if at some point that product stops working, either because of poor mixing or being cheap or just not following the instructions, we end up causing things like resistance. And what happens is, is we make the product obsolete. It may have filled in a very important niche, and now that product, because of its misuse, is no longer in production. Okay? And we need to keep as many products as possible. Um, and this is especially important in, in cropland and in the resistance game. Okay? You know, no one can afford to lose active ingredients. And if we don't apply properly by mixing properly, there's a really good chance that we could elevate resistance to a point where it, it makes that chemical worthless. So tank mixing is, is the kind of thing that, that keeps this from happening. And chemical companies absolutely have a vested interest in this. They want their products used correctly every time. They don't want to risk losing it. They don't want to risk having to change formulation or um, even remarket whole products. You know, changing any label is a hundreds of million dollar thing. So getting into the nitty gritty of this, huh, see what I did there? Plug, plug filter, eh, go with it. I've been in seclusion a long time. Uh, so having a poor solution can lead to degradation of your equipment. Okay. And that can lead to things like clogged filters, clogged pumps. Okay. Uh, going out of order, especially with dry formulations, you can plug up nozzles, you can plug up filters real quick. Okay. So the label is going to tell you very specifically, not just the order that that product should go into the tank, but also what the base of that formulation is. Is it dry? Is it liquid? What is it? Now, all of you are probably familiar with whales. Um, and whales, as new products have continued to come onto the shelf, has become moderately outdated. Okay, it, it's still applicable in some cases, but it, it's advanced over the years. Okay, and it used to start with, this was the order that you put things in the tank. Wettable powders, agitate the tank, add your liquids, add your most viable concentrates, add your surfactants, okay? But then water conditioners started playing a bigger part and a bigger role. And more complex products that required extra adjuvants and surfactants started to become uh, more commonplace. And that, that really uh, created a complex tank mixing system, okay? And so really it needs to start with preparation. Okay, They're, having an acronym for something like this has kind of uh, gone away, right? This needs to be more of a standard operating procedure, and it should start with reading the label, okay? Check your labels, reference your labels. Make sure that the products are ready to be put into the tank. If you have something like emulsifiable concentrates, shake them up, or any liquid for that matter. If it's sat in a jug for the entire winter, Agitate that sucker. Make sure that it is back into a solution. Uh, sometimes you have to create slurries with dry products, especially if you're adding a large volume, okay? And, you know, adding water, making sure you have an, uh, um, the right amount of water for things to get mixed. Sometimes that's a quarter of a tank, sometimes that's a half a tank, sometimes that's even three quarters of a tank. And the other big thing is agitation, okay? There's a lot of cheap tanks and cheap sprayers on the market that don't have any sort of agitators, okay? That don't have a cycle flow or anything like that. And, and you really need some form of agitation in your tank to keep that mixture moving, okay? So 
the order of things is really dependent on, on several factors. Obviously, the components of the chemical, but it really uh, breaks down to creating an effective um, solution. Okay? And being able to do that depends on a little bit of chemistry. I'm going to pause real, real quick. Um, let me show you something exciting. So that depends on, on putting things in solution. And for things to go into solution, it requires a process of whether or not it's soluble. Okay? And if you've never understood what solubility is, solubility is a ratio, more or less, of how well things mix. So here's just some regular old water, um, distilled water, actually. So this is table salt I added. Now, table salt, at the right amount, will really start to dissolve in water. Okay? And you can see it's starting to dissolve, and then we add a little more. But the more salt I add to that water, the less it dissolves, right? Because that ratio starts to become unbalanced. And this can happen with dry goods, this couldn't happen with liquid goods, but at some point, you can potentially add more of a product that can actually dissolve in the carrier. And that can become a real hazard um, with tanks. And the other issue that you're gonna run into is understanding that sometimes, no matter how good the product, um, I should say, it isn't always going to um, go into solution effectively. And what might happen is, is that you might have to continually agitate that tank to keep it in a solution, right? So that can cause some pretty big issues, right? But that is the first component you need to understand is that everything in order to operate in that tank needs to go into solution. We either need to provide that solution by good mixing or proper agitation, okay? So starting from the beginning, water-soluble packets. These can be like your dyes and some other stuff. And then you're putting in your dry formulations, and then you're adding your water conditioners. Then you have dry anti-drift agents, and then you have compatibility agents and other foamers. And then you have dispersed liquid formulations, right? And you have liquid anti-drift. Then you have regular liquids. And then you have adjuvants. And then you have the kitchen sink. Okay? There's a whole lot of stuff that might potentially go into a tank. And if you were to put it all in at once, you'd run into some major problems. Now, sometimes you can make a tank mix too complex. Okay? And try to avoid that if at all possible. But sometimes it can't be avoided. So basically, we've turned whales into what about what? Would Dadalac, would the cat, would, would Adalac, would Adalac, Dad's Wadalac, I don't know. Uh, but so water soluble packets, right? You have dyes, usually, sometimes products. You get dry formulations, right? These are the kind of things that you have to allow for good agitation. Then you have water conditioners. These can be like AMS, which comes as either a dry or a liquid. You can have acidifiers and buffers and other things. Then you have dry anti-drift agents, not just anti-drift agents, but the dry products. Then you have compatibility agents, distillates, foamers, stuff like that, and they need to hang out in the water. And then on top of that, you have stuff like dispersed liquids, okay? Your emulsifiables, things that have to be shooken up. Then liquid anti-drift, then regular liquids, then your adjuvants, and then there's that kitchen sink. And the kitchen sink is usually specified by the label, okay? The label will tell you very specifically, this needs to be added at the end or at the beginning or whatever, okay? Um, so you'll see these come in acronyms, right? Um, and I won't spend too much time on these. Some of them I've never even heard of or used for that matter, but become familiar with them, right? These are very obvious up front on the label, but the label will still break it down for you, okay? And there's a lot. Um, yeah, they're all over the place. And so something I want to give you an idea of is, is the label will um, kind of throw some different things at you on occasion. So this is uh, for Beyond, ammonium salt of a right? 
if you're only using Beyond and you're using no other products, it's very simple. Fill up your tank about halfway, three quarters. While the pump is running, add your Beyond, put in the required adjuvants, fill in the remainder of water, and go to it. But what if you want to add other products? What if you want to create that second definition of tank mixing? Then you get this, and it becomes a little more complex. You need to fill your spray tank. Then you need to add your soluble packets. Then, right, you need to add some of your dry stuff, like your wettable powders, your dispersible granules, your dry flowables. And then you add your beyond. Now, the trick here is your beyond comes before any other liquid solutions, okay, including those uh, suspended liquids, okay? So that changes the classic tank mix strategy. Then you add all that other stuff. So the label here obviously is telling you something different than the classic go-to. Uh, so it's just another reinforcement of using the label. Another thing to consider in this modern age uh, are things like this. Some of you may have seen one of these, some of you may not. These are uh, inductor cyclones. Okay, anybody who's using extra large tanks, 1,200 gallon, 15, 2,000 gallon sprayers, these are lifesavers. Okay, these are people who are adding hundreds of gallons of product to a tank per load. Okay, you find these on fill trailers, you find these on fill trucks, on tenders, whatever. So if you're not using like shuttles uh, to put chemical in the tank, you're going to want one of these. And basically, uh, what it is, is it's, is it's running external water, and it is adding the chemical directly into that line, so it's mixing and agitating as it enters the tank, okay? Some of these even have a spike in the middle, so all you've got to do is slam your jug down, and it gets triple rinsed as it's going into the tank, okay? And, and these are for operations that uh, measure um, applications by the gallon and not by the ounce, right? And they come in all sorts of different flavors, all sorts of different sizes, uh, usually as simple or as complex as you want. And these have big lines, you know, four inches, six inches. Some of the really, really big ones uh, even have eight inch lines. Now, these are gonna shorten up the time it takes to fill, and they're definitely going to streamline your mixing strategy, but they're not going to eliminate it, right? They're not gonna remove issues like order, you still need to follow the proper order. Because as I said, with the salt, there are certain products that no matter how much carrier you add to them, they might never become fully soluble. And so instead, they have to run in suspension. So they have to sit and move around the tank. Okay? And so you still need to follow the proper order, and you still need to make sure that everything is being agitated correctly. Okay? This doesn't mean that you can just hook up a whole bunch of products and start putting them in at once without any concern for the order. The order is still vastly important. So here's just an example of another tender. Uh, here's another manufacturer's type. Now something, if, if I've got plenty of weed coordinators on here that you'll recognize, there's another method of spraying that kind of, that can potentially uh, throw tank mixing out the window in some cases. And that's if you're using an injector system, okay? There are even some large self-propelled sprayers that use injectors, okay? And these are adding a metered specified amount of the product directly into the line as it feeds to the nozzles, okay? And these are very manufacturer specific, right? Their settings are, can be a pain sometimes, right? If you're using injectors. Um, so the big thing with this kind of stuff is, you know, just making sure that everything is being kept clean. Uh, they do have a, a tendency to become gummed up, right, if you're switching products too many times. And you can use dry products with these. You just have to create a permanent slurry, right? And the thing you have to be careful of with that, though, is, is that slurry can plug up really easily, okay? Just the whole carrier tank and everything. So making sure you're keeping an eye on it, keeping it clean is very important, right? All right, here's just an example, in case maybe you've never seen one. Uh, 
but it, it does make application very handy. Um, and, and these tend to be pretty complex in how they're set up. Um, but here's just the kind that's usually on a self-repelled. And a lot of times you'll find that you have two active ingredient tanks um, and then one maybe surfactant or adjuvant or fertilizer tank as well. Now, oh, sorry, when I switched cameras, it kind of flubbed up my um, presentation a little bit. If you hadn't entered it already, uh, please enter your licensing information uh, just as a check-in. Um, if you entered it a couple of minutes ago, I'm sure it's not a big deal. Like I said, I kind of jumped the gun. But moving on, okay. There's a reason we use proper order. Okay? There's all sorts of different reactions that can happen in and around the tank. And they can cause a mix to fail pretty easily. And these failures can manifest physically, right? And those tend to be obvious, or they can happen chemically, less obvious, biologically, excuse me, or they can just become inert and useless. Um, and, and as I said, you know, it's the ones that we can't see that are most dangerous. And these forms of, uh, let's call it uselessness, Okay, or when these herbicides aren't getting along, it's called antagonism. Okay, and it comes in four different flavors, more or less. There's biochemical, there's competitive, physiological, and chemical. Okay, and these have all sorts of different reactions that can happen. Uh, most often, the tank mix is just going to become neutralized and stop working. Okay. Uh, pretty sure my mic is still working. I had somebody just say that they can't hear anything. Um, can everybody else hear? I can still hear you, Matt. Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Um, I can hear you as well, Matt. Okay. So, the other thing to consider about antagonism, okay, is it happens three times more often than synergism. Synergism being the good cop to antagonism's bad cop, okay? And so that antagonism, it's, as I said, likely to happen a lot. Um, and sometimes it's unexpected, okay? And sometimes it's from uh, factors that we have no control over. So biochemical antagonism, it limits adjuvants, really, in a tank mix. Uh, and it's very much so influenced by environmental conditions. So what happens is with biochemical antagonism is you end up seeing a reduced absorption, penetration, translocation of the chemical by the plant. This is the sort of situation that happens when the plant looks sad and then survives, okay? And it's usually brought on by we didn't use a correct adjuvant um, or did not use an adjuvant at all, okay? Um, maybe two products that we put in uh, simply reacted differently on the surface of the plant. Maybe we didn't uh, follow the rain fast period and it washed off, okay? And so this is just bare bones. The chemical didn't make it, not enough chemical made it into the plant to kill it. After that comes competitive antagonism. And this one, this one's a little bit more complex because every time you think you understand it, there comes an exception to the rule. Uh, that's something that I've realized over the years that I've been given this presentation is that it should be pretty straightforward, uh, but it isn't. Okay? This is kind of a wasteful antagonism. This is what happens if you use two chemicals that are extremely similar, so similar to the point that only one will work. Okay, because the other one just uh, becomes useful. So the best example is by uh, 2,4-D and MCPA. Okay, they both go to the same site. They uh, both have the same uptake. Pretty much everything's the same in a lot of ways. Okay, and so putting them in the tank together, only one of them's going to work, right? The other one isn't, and so you're only at 50% efficacy. Right, so one of those chemicals has been wasted. Uh, amine and ester, using those together, using glyphosate and glufosinate. Okay, 
they're just only one of them is going to reach the translocation point. Okay? The rest of them probably aren't. Uh, amino pyrrolid and picloram, okay, mixing milestone and tordon. I mean, you could, I, but I don't know what the benefit is, right? Because they're pretty much eliminating the same things. Same target spots, the whole shebang. Uh, another way to look at this is if you're adding something like paraquat to a tank mix, okay? You have to be very careful with this. And I know not a lot of you uh, right away folks are using paraquat. Actually, there's not a lot of reason to use paraquat right away, right? And the, the reason you have competitive antagonism with that is because the paraquat is really, it, it's killing the plant before the other chemical can translocate, okay? Now, some, like I said, there's always exceptions to these things. Sometimes you throw uh, glyphosate in with the paraquat in case you have really heavy coverage, right? In which case the hope is, is that some of that glyphosate will penetrate deeper into the canopy that the paraquat doesn't, right? And uh, if the paraquat doesn't kill the whole plant, hopefully the glyphosate does. But in the instance that the paraquat does kill the whole plant, it, it can't uh, translocate the, the glyphosate. Now, like I said, there's exceptions. Uh, some of those would be like aminopyrrolid and aminocyclopyrrolor. Okay, putting um, perspective and milestone together. Right, you get that. They work. They're very closely related, but they work. And the one that boggles my mind every time is adding chlorosulfuron and methylfuron together. Okay, uh, what is that? Cimarron plus or Cimarron max? One of those two. Um, you would never think that those two should be mixed together because they are so closely related and do so many of the same things. Um, but on occasion, you need different traits uh, that the other doesn't have. So like I said, there's always an exception to the rule. Now, physiological antagonism. This is where herbicides are gonna counteract each other at different uptake points, okay? Um, this form will change the biological effect of a herbicide sometimes an opposite effect. And uh, this is something I only recently learned, and don't ask me on the science of it because I'm, I mean, I tell people I'm that smart, whether I am or not is a whole different discussion, but 2,4-D and a lot of grass herbicides um, or A-case inhibitors, you know, specifically. What happens is, is that 2,4-D is actually um, in some cases allowing grasses to metabolize the A cases better, which means they won't kill them fully. Um, and like I said, I don't fully understand it because I'm not sure why the grass is utilizing the 2,4-D in the first place, but research has shown that you shouldn't mix them together. You also used to see this a lot with like um, wild oat herbicides and some other ones, but this is most often happening if you try and put broadleaf herbicides and grass herbicides in the same tanks, okay? Finally, chemical antagonism. This is the physical one. This is the one we see. This is creating cottage cheese, and this is creating those instances where things just are not working out together, okay? So let's talk first about glyphosate and water quality. Uh, this subject frustrates me because no matter how much uh, myself and other colleagues talk about it, we're never taken very seriously on it. Um, and that is in order for glyphosate to work at 100% capacity, it needs to be added to treated water. Okay. Um, and it needs to, uh, yeah, treated water. You can't add it to hard water or well water, or you can't add it to tanks that you've uh, pumped water out of a ditch or a creek or anything like that, okay? The water needs to be treated. And the reason for that is because of glyphosate's AOC, right? The uh, absorption coefficient, in other words. And you'll see Roundup at the top, and you see Gramoxone at the bottom. This is how likely these chemicals are to bind to minerals and to um, sediment and to organic matter that might be in the tank, okay? So, I mean, once they're attached, they're not becoming detached. And alternatively, you can see Tordon and Dicamba are, are 16 and two, right? And we know that Tordon and Dicamba really like to move with water, 
okay? They don't stick to stuff. That's what allows them to move. Whereas opposite of that, Roundup and Paraquat do, okay? Something to consider is that hard water is what's causing the problem, okay? Montana, 50% of Montanans use well water, okay? There's a lot of hard water in Montana. There's a high, lot of uh, turbid water in Montana. Okay, it's out there. Our water has a lot of cations. And those cations are what are binding up the glyphosate. They are positively charged. Okay? And glyphosate is negatively charged. What happens when you put something positively charged and negatively charged together? They stick, right? And they don't want to come undone. Right. Now, another fun presentation for you all. Bring it up real quick. I know you're super excited about this because I'm excited about this because it's going to work. The last time I did this demo, it didn't work. I have for you some hard water, okay? Uh, certifiable hard water. I don't know what makes it certifiable. I just know that it's hard. Now, uh, let's pretend that I also have some glyphosate. Okay. Now, the problem we have with telling people that uh, hard water can neutralize glyphosate is they can't really see it. They don't see it till after the fact. Okay. But let me show you what happens when something binds with hard water. Okay. In case you can't tell, that went from clear to white. That is basically what is happening when you put glyphosate in hard water. It is binding the same way. The only difference is, is that you're not actually seeing it. Okay? It is happening on, happening on a microscopic level, right? And so convincing people of that is hard. Um, but there's a way to fix that. AMS. Ammonium sulfate. Now, I'm not going to get into whether dry is better than liquid, what's more effective. They're both effective. They both do the job. Okay? One of them is just easier to mix into the tank than the other. So it doesn't matter which you're using. Okay? Let me just state that again. It doesn't matter which AMS you're using. If you are using glyphosate in your field, especially if it's being used on a Roundup Ready product or if you're out um, controlling bare ground or whatever. If you want it to work 100%, you need to add AMS. What AMS is doing is it is creating a barrier, okay? It is attaching to the glyphosate, creating a barrier there to keep it from hitting those cations, and it is attaching to the cations and creating a barrier there. And on top of it, it's also allowing the glyphosate to be better absorbed by our target plant. Okay. So not only is it letting glyphosate work 100%, it's also giving it like a 10% boost. Okay. And you can see those results in a field when you add AMS. And that's why we're using it. So again, it's not about the dry end or the liquid end, the convenience of it, the price of it. Use one or use the other, but use them. I hit all the right buttons. Okay, why, why, why do we have to struggle with this? Um, why don't the companies just have it laid out what works? In Montana, there's 299 commonly used products, okay? Herbicides, just herbicides. This doesn't take into account adjuvants or factants. Uh, this doesn't take into account insecticides, fungicides. This is only herbicides, okay? If we have two products, there are 44,000 combinations of that product, okay? If we use three products, 4 million possible combinations from those 299. If we use four, 326 million. If we use five, 19 million. And like I said, that's not taking in the adjuvants that we're adding into the tank, which may also have an effect. So when you're adding five products to the tank, 
there's a chance for over 19 billion combinations to mix together. And the reason this is such a huge problem is because all of these uh, products have inactive ingredients in them. And those inactive ingredients are what make these proprietary, right? They are the difference between Roundup and Mikazi and Glystar. Okay? And we don't know what those are. Other manufacturers don't know what those are. So they cannot plan for those different interactions, okay, if they don't always know what is in that jug. So let's say we throw that out the window. There are 78 active ingredients sold in Montana, okay? So we really chopped that down. Out of those active ingredients, combining two of them, there's 3,000 possible combinations. We combine three, 76,000. Four, over a million. Five, over 20 million. 20 million possible combinations. Okay, so even if all we did, even if manufacturers only focused um, on the active ingredients, there's still over 20 million possible combinations. They're never going to be able to know for certain. Okay. So there are all of these billions of potential uh, interactions, and we understand so very little. Uh, let me tell you a fun story. Okay, so I... Um, I don't want to start my fun story. So back in the 90s, back, huh, it was 30 years ago now. In the 90s and the 80s, um, winter wheat production, uh, 240 ester was a big thing, right? Everybody liked ester. Uh, and so was using UAN, urea ammonia nitrate, as a carrier, liquid fertilizer. Okay, that's what they did in winter wheat production. It worked great. The problem is, what's the issue with uh, 240 ester? Well, it's highly volatile, right? Really likes to uh, drift. So, um, sorry, I, I keep getting distracted by the chat. I should just close that real quick. There we go, handled. Um, so, you know, amine was developed. Amine, far less volatile, um, a little less effective, but that was saved, right? And so what they didn't understand with the amine is, you know, what might happen when it's added to that UAN. And I love technology. Oop, 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 there it is. Now, some of you have seen this before, some of you haven't. What I have here is UAN, okay? Liquid fertilizer, liquid urea. What I have here, oh, and it smells horrible, is uh, some amine. Now, watch the birdie very closely. Now, in case some of you missed that, oh no, in case some of you missed that, I can turn a li two liquids into a solid. What can you do? Um, can you imagine trying to clean that out of a $500,000 sprayer, self-propelled sprayer? I can't. I wouldn't want to be that guy. Um, that is one of those interactions that no one planned for. And here's the other thing. I'm sure people are interested. Modern science can't actually explain why. I spoke to actual Bayer um, biochemists in, uh, what was it, Zurich, okay? People that develop the actual Bayer products. And they're like, I don't know. It just does. Like sometimes that's the answer. It just does, okay? So this is one of those things that we simply don't understand why it acts the way it acts. Okay? And for those thousands of farmers that ran into this horrible problem, it could have been avoided. Every label discusses the jar test. Okay? Gives you specific directions on how you put that jar test together. And the jar test is the easiest and most efficient way to know 
whether two products are going to get along or not. Um, use it. If you're unsure, reference it. Okay, reference it with your adjuvants. Reference it with other chemic, with uh, other pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, anything that you might use. It could save you so much in the long run. Now, you're not putting liquid nitrogen and uh, 240-amine in one-to-one -one ratio in the tank, but that's enough to where even if I did a one-to-ten ratio, it's going to create crystals, and the, it's like a wax, okay? And basically what's going to happen is that those are going to bind up in the filters and in the pump, and you're still going to run into problems. So I can't talk about antagonism without going over synergism. Um, and the basics of synergism, synergism is what keeps things in the bottle, in the jug. Synergism is most often those inactive ingredients that are things like adjuvants and safeners, Okay, they are allowing the actual active ingredient to function on the plant. They are allowing for uptake. Oh, that amine stinks. I lost the cap and it's just kind of hanging out. I'll be fine, I think. Maybe. So, uh, making the most out of a mix. Okay, um, I am going to go over some popular tank mixes real quick, but... Some things to remember is the reason we're tank mixing is to avoid things like herbicide resistance, okay? Even a herbicide that works 99% of the time, there is still a 1% chance that a weed will survive. So if you're spraying 100 weeds, one of them survives and it sets 10,000 seeds, that's 10,000 plants that are now no longer susceptible to that chemical, okay? In one year, if you're using a single dose herbicide, it's gonna work, likely. It's gonna work pretty well. You use that same herbicide, single one, in the same spot, at the same time, probably not gonna work as well. Maybe you have a survivor. Five years later, if you're still doing the same thing, it's not even gonna work anymore, okay? You have selected very purposefully for one plant to survive and set seed. And you can avoid this just by adding two different modes of action sometimes, okay? Even if all you ever do is mix different groups or different families within a group, sorry, different families within a group, that is enough, okay? Um, and that's why it's so important. So popular modes of actions for uh, right away and rangeland. When it comes to crop production, okay, um, lots of options for herbicide mode of actions, right? Lots of different groups that can be used in very um, specialized scenarios, okay? Because it's a monoculture. When it comes to right of ways in rangeland, that obviously changes, okay? We are very limited in what we can use out in the field. So some popular ones, group twos. ALS inhibitors, uh, the occasional use of grass herbicides, imazimox, imazepic, okay? But more importantly, you have sulfonylureas, okay? When we're talking about um, forb control, broadleaf herbicides, things like chlorosulfuron, metsulfuron, remsulfuron. And even in some cases, uh, group nine being glyphosate, right? In, in right away scenarios for grass control or bare ground, there is, um, there's, there's a place for glyphosate to fit in. Then you have the very popular ones, okay? The group fours. These are the ones that you can really kind of mix cross families with. You have benzos, like dicamba, uh, pyridines, you know, those are your aminopyrrolids, colpyrrolids, fluoroxapyr, triclopyr, picloram, aminocyclopyrichlor, Okay, these are those really ones that you always see mixed with stuff like 2,4-D, which is a phenoxy, okay? These are three families of herbicides that you see come pre-mixed a lot, and that's good. You want uh, to know that they get along well, and you also see them mixed with sulfonylureas a lot. Okay, and then there's other things like group 14. Now, group 14, using those is really going to raise your, uh, 
per acre or per mile uh, cost, however it is, but they're just one more tool in there. So even if you only include them once uh, every five years, it's good enough in the rotation to work, okay? And something to think about is not just changing up these mixes uh, once a year, but once a season. So try and make your fall mix different than your spring mix. Even if it comes down to, you know, maybe in the spring I'll use um, Picloram, and in the fall I'll use Milestone. Maybe in the spring I'll use Metsulfuron, in the fall I'll use Chloral Sulfuron. Uh, Dicamba in the spring, and, you know, chances are you're going to use 240 year-round. But even that little bit of mix is enough to make a huge difference in combating resistance. Okay, now popular mix types, um, I'm not going to give you ultra specifics like product names and stuff like that. Uh, I don't have that kind of time for um, those kind of arguments, so to speak. But so long as you're combining these, you're going to be successful. Okay, having a surfactant, an adjuvant, always beneficial, okay, should be in there, especially if the label calls for it. Um, so uh, a non-ionic surfactant, okay? Having a group two, a sulfonylurea, like chlorosulfuron or metsulfuron. Having a phenoxy, like 2,4-D or MCPA, okay? Having a group four, a pyridine, like triclopyr or colpyrolid or aminopyrolid or picloram, okay? And sometimes, this is one of those exceptions, those can be mixed together. Okay, you'll find triclopyr sometimes mixed with aminopyrrolid. Uh, sometimes you'll find fluoroxapyr mixed with triclopyr. Um, so even those will mix around sometimes. When it comes to grass, you are far more limited. Okay, you're pretty much stuck with combining group twos together. Um, and then with the newly released indazaflam, that group 29. And then as I said, you also still have that group nine, the glyphosate, um, which does have good efficacy when working in cheatgrass, okay? So uh, if there's any questions, I saw quite a few in the chat. I'm happy to answer them. Yes, this is me that did this. Uh, we're not going to talk about it. It was an exciting day for everybody. Uh, one other plug real quick because I'm shameless. Uh, I host the Montana Egg Cast, which is an agricultural podcast. Um, which I have guests on on occasion. Uh, you can find it just by doing a quick search for MT Agcast on the interwebs. Uh, I will be releasing a new one tonight, which features our very own Jane Mangold. Um, and so subscribe. It's 100% worth it. But that's what I have. Like I said, I saw that there were some chat questions. Um, is AMS from Stacy Clark. Is AMS considered an ionic surfactant then? Um, not necessarily. It is used, AMS is a combination of nitrogen and, oh, not, ni not necessarily nitrogen, ammonia and sulfur, and ends up creating nitrogen once it's in the soil and stuff. Um, sometimes glyphosate, depending on the use, will ask for a non-ionic surfactant. The two of them can be put in the tank together. Uh, just making sure that you do them in the correct order. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, chat's moving too fast. Uh, is there a place that lists the 78 active ingredients allowed in Montana? Uh, I went and counted them. So that list, um, yeah, I basically went around to uh, all of the um, uh, Providers, many, not, I don't even, the word is escaping me right now. It's been such a ridiculously long day. Every store, uh, including like CPS, Wilbur Ellis, Helen Chemical, all of them, they were happy enough to give me uh, say the uh, product lists, and I just went from there. Is the order the same when mixing in a cyclone and mixing in a tank? Yes, it is. That order is very important regardless. Um, if it wants, you know, uh, dry put in first if the label calls for that, and that's what you need to do. The reason is if you were to add something like a crop oil, methylated seed oil first, and then add a dry, doesn't matter if it's in a cyclone, that dry 
if it hits one of those hunks of oil before it's um, gone into any sort of solution or anything like that, that oil will surround that dry and bind it up, okay, and you'll clog. So in instances like that, you know, you always follow the label, regardless of how that's getting mixed. Those were all the ones that I saw. Matt, um, there may have been, I don't know if you found, saw this one. It was the first one that came in. Um, it had to do with your five minute sit time on the compatibility agent slide. Oh, good Lord. Can you, they were is looking for a little more clarification is, on that. And they were also wondering, is Loveland's Choice Weathermaster water conditioning agent an example of this? That was way back at the, I think the beginning of your presentation. And they're in the chat? Uh, it's in the question and answer, okay. but. Okay. Hang on, let me extend, there we go. Uh, the five minute sit time for compatibil compatibility agents. So I don't, that one really applies to insecticides a lot um, because sometimes with insecticides, you are adding certain acidifiers in there um, at specific times to help break through uh, the shells and stuff like that. When it comes to adding things like, um, oh, hang on. I had a list here. Uh, basically, it's allowing for proper agitation to go into solution, right? So those compatibility agents, um, where was my example? Okay, those like the stillets and the foamers, right? They're doing a very specific job. So the foamers are basically breaking down your foam, right? Like maybe you added a, um, something that really just is likely to foam. Well, you don't want to add it after it starts to foam. You want to add it beforehand, okay, to keep it from happening. Um, with some of the distillates and stuff, it's just, it's still a form of water conditioning, but it's not listed specifically as a water conditioner. It's just helping with the breakdown and helping it go into solution. Okay, Matt, I saw, I know we're, we're a little, it's 201 now, but I want to throw this out there because I think a lot of people probably deal with this. In the chat box, someone asked if you have any tips on using marker dye in, like, if you have a glyphosate and AMS uh, mix, what about dye? Is any special considerations there? Dyes go in first. Um, if you have foam markers and stuff, it's a separate tank, so it runs differently. But if you're adding in dyes, any more, so many dyes are coming in soluble packets uh, to help with the mess. Um, anybody who's ever messed around with dye knows that it gets everywhere. It's worse than glitter. Um, they, they just go in first to help with that. The reason a soluble packet goes in first, it's literally a, a piece of plastic that dissolves in the water. And so you're putting in that in first and allowing good agitation so it has time to dissolve. Um, so the, real quick, I didn't get to fan it, finish the one about uh, the choice. So that, uh, what, so that's basically AMS, the Weather Master is. So that would go in um, just right after any of your dry goods, okay? Um, chlorinated water, not really. Uh, chlorinated water can still sometimes be a little hard, usually due to um, the pipes. You know, if it's running in old iron pipes, um, iron can bind with glyphosate just as easy as anything else. Milestone and escort on grass damage. Um, you can certainly have grass damage with escort um, if you make a hot mix. Um, if you spray, if your timing is poor, so midsummer hot day, um, it has, uh, metsulfuron has a little bit longer um, Oil time. So, yeah, you can notice burn with that. You're also likely to notice burn on a hot day with a non ionic surfactant as well. Um, I think that kind of did. Okay, did we get did we get most of them? <laughs> I'm, not right. seeing, I'm not seeing any others. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and then just a little bit of housekeeping. <laughs> 